<clears throat> okay, <clears throat> I begin. So today, November the 9th, the great Giambattista Piranesi died. So I wrote this poem for him because, as I said, this year there are 300 years since his birth. I begin. I called him Pironesi. I played with the word because Piro refers to fire. And you'll understand at the end why the reference to fire. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, but this happened after 1778. That is, it happened after you, Pironesi, died. Bastille felt, it is true, but what about the inner Bastille? Carcere di invenzione or not, are we all prisoners eternally? Probably, with very few exceptions. But what are we to do with the equally eternal big yes? The architects, some of them claim architecture is all about. Is there room for pessimism in architecture? And how come some of those who do believe in the yes admire you, Giovanni Battista? Wolf Briggs asked himself, what is architecture? He answered, yes. But maybe you, Giovanni Battista, would have answered to the very same question, no. How is it? Is architecture a yes or a no? The construction, I felt, represented, symbolized an obvious no. Although looking at it from a different angle, maybe it itself was a yes. A yes to fury, to the tornado, to the turbulence. A yes to conflict, to drama, to war. A yes to taking apart, ripping off. A yes to destruction. But didn't you also, Giovanni Battista, ripped off huge structures, maybe in some kind of anticipation of the fall of Bastille? But again, what about the inner Bastille? Yes, we collapsed the worlds of the real one. Yes, liberté, égalité, fraternité made its revolutionary song be heard everywhere or almost everywhere, yet the philosopher was probably right. The most important victory is over oneself. And those who tore down the walls of Bastille perhaps didn't tear down the walls of the inner prison. Just look the deconstructivist perhaps didn't do, just like the deconstructivist perhaps didn't do it, perhaps. But we do need truth. In the absence of truth, we perish, said Le Corbusier, although himself sometimes didn't tell the truth, like, for example, in those doctor photographs he published in order to sustain graphically his truth. But then what is truth? My truth might not be your truth. And indeed, as George Bernard Shaw said, in a room might not be two people, but six. The one I think you are, the one you think you are, the one you really are, plus the one you think I am, the one I think I am, the one I really am. Thus, six, and maybe even this number is too low and misleading. Your talent as, a, as an etcher, Giovanni Battista, was indeed out of this world sometimes, although your son Francesco was good too. How did you see the world, Giovanni Battista? Did you foresee the disaster? Did you foresee the general ruin? Did you depict the grandeur of dissolution in order to memorialize fall and decline or in order to increase our inborn ap appetite, appetite for hope? You do move, this is for sure, even not quite innocent people like Mr. Coolhouse, even if he likes you, everybody likes you. Who cares you didn't build much and you didn't build significantly? You built with incisions in the steel plate and in ink. Are, your, uh, are you, uh, your etchings real? Yes, they are much more real than many of the so-called real buildings. But are all built buildings real? No, they are not. They are just illusions or delusions. They do not exist, Piranesi, except through the pollution they provoked. Plus, if architecture does not exist, as Louis Kahn said, what would the difference be between a built building and a draw and a drawing? Although, of course, even temporarily, a building should be confronted with the elements. It is a must, perhaps. You were born in October, halfway in terms of days between Ingels and Le Corbusier. The young Ingels and the even younger Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier said 
then the real challenge in life is not to remain young, but to become young. Your etching, Spiranesi, show exactly this, becoming. They are about the dynamics of life. If there is a, uh, if there is a constant, it is the eternal return of the same. Things go up and things go down. Life moves on, but so does death. Ruins are replaced by the new, only for the new to follow not much later. The same fatidic destiny. But maybe the ruin is not fatidic. The ruin tells us how the building was made. The ruin reminds us of what is to follow. The ruin tempers our vanity, even in the case of the great pharaohs. What happened to Villa Adriana in Tivoli? Ruin and the wind and the rain and the dust tempest still hid the monolith named Kyops. You expressed respect quite powerfully. You saw and depicted the cemetery, the human cemetery. All is grave or waiting to become grave. Are we to mourn? Maybe. Or maybe we should laugh in rowers, since indeed Nietzsche was perhaps right. Only the human laughs because the human suffered the most. Did you suffer, Gianni Battista? Maybe not. Maybe your artwork sufficed to sublimate the pain. Maybe. We thank you for what you gave us, even if some of your works adorn glittering suburban kitchen or maybe especially then to contrast them, a stove, a refrigerator, a sink, and on the wall, vedute di Roma, or worse or better, Pestum, the temple of Hera. Yes, that very heavy temple, immensely heavy, because before the Doric, there was just weight, 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 the weight of gravity, that cosmic force that haunts us, forcing us to imagine in great fear that we can't escape it. But why should we escape the beautiful certitude, maybe the only one that we have? Gravity, the force of gravity. It is said that at Pestum, an infertile couples, if they spend the night there, become miraculously fertile. What attracted you to Pestum? Maybe the very same reasons that attracted chronologically Winkelmann, Goethe, Kant all great admirers, admirers of the telluric force of Hera's temple. Kant said it clearly, for me, Pestum is more important than the Parthenon. I would agree, it is, although the tourist loves more a Polish truth, which might not be a truth at all, than the rough one. But Kant himself, as we know, in certain aspects of his life lied. We all lie, we are all liars. You lie too, maybe making us believe that there is beauty in ruins, in death. No, there isn't. We should all cry together with you. The end cannot be happy. It is to be, if it is to be a ruin, let's not be delusional. We grow towards becoming ruins and our buildings as well. In between, there is the illusion, delusion named life. We thank you though, Piranesi, for depicting for us the grandeur of death. We thank you for immortalizing mortality. We thank you for telling us that darkness will follow. It will always follow. Or is it the very same darkness that preceded us? Maybe, maybe the very same darkness in the eternal swing between yesterday, now, and tomorrow. But tomorrow will be the next yesterday. And as lovers of symmetry, we might say that yesterday all was always, and it might always be, another tomorrow. We salute you on your 300th birthday, and we hope one day we'll meet in that very beyond you find yourself in. Now, but what is now? It already passed. And Ungaretti steps in, whispering, and I got the taste of that winged desire that light represses when it dies. Yes, fire, fire. That fairy fire Heraclitus thought was the beginning of all things, even of God. That fire that burns everything down, that fire that brings everything up. That pyro that you were carrying in your soul and in your hand, <clears throat> etcher. The fire that warms us, that burns us in the winter of our solitude. Okay, <laughs> this is what I wrote. And now I'll show you some, uh, some pictures of, uh, of his engravings. I, I kind of presented two or three times Piranesi, so uh, I'm a little bit uh, not tired, but I, I don't like to, to, 
uh, repeat myself. So I'll show you a short version of, uh, of, of his work now because I, I, I made a longer presentation about him on the 4th of October when it was his birthday. So I'll just show you some, uh, some uh, etchings that he made, especially from the series Il Carcere d'Invenzione, the, the prisons uh, that I also mentioned in, in what I just read to you. I, I think he was a very modern spirit in the 18th century. I mean, these are psychological landscape or psycho landscapes. They are architectural, but they represent, I mean, they are the invention and they are inventions, but they represent the inner world, the world of, the, of, of his soul, of his imagination, of his mind. You see the written carcere d'invenzione, Gian Battista, Piranesi, uh, a great, um, a great uh, draftsman and etcher. Um, what he built was not so moving as his etchings, but he still, I mean, people extremely diverse, like Rem Kolhas and uh, Wolf Prix, they both love Piranesi. When they were asked, you know, tell us, uh, you know, a few names of the people you admire. They mentioned Piranesi out of, you know, five names, which, which, which says a lot about the influence, the power of, of, of uh, Piranesi's art, even on contemporary people. Uh, okay, so, we look at this uh, carcere d'invenzione and what do we see? <clears throat> well, we see monumental architectures that uh, sooner or later are destined to the final, uh, you know, uh, resolution, so to speak, you know. Uh, yes, the sunlight still enters the big uh, uh, inner prison, uh, but um, there is something uh, majestically tragic about this, uh, these visions that he had. And also, I would say, it's a commentary coming from the 17th century when he lived, he was born in 1720 and died in 1778. Uh, so he lived in the 18th century. But you'll see some kind of a connection with the other three people I will talk about today, who were all three of them historicists and, you know, the oldest of them, that is uh, Piranesi, actually achieved what I would call uh, a history or an history because, because his historical reference is actually, uh, well, it, it, it shouldn't be uh, named really historical because he transcends history. While the, the younger three ones that I will talk about today, they didn't, they didn't transcend uh, history. And that is a, a deficiency, I would say, they had and have. Because I do believe what uh, Charles Baudelaire, <clears throat> the great uh, French uh, poet said, a good work in art uh, is, uh, has two halves. One half speaks about the, um, the ephemeral, the circumstantial, the temporary, and the other half about the eternal and the immutable. Art has to have both sides. If it doesn't, uh, it, it, will, uh, it will have a, an ephemeral uh, um, life. Anyway, uh, so Piranesi, 300 years since his birth, but he died on the, on the 9th of November and uh, he should be remembered because he deserves it. Although, you know, he didn't build uh, much and he didn't really build uh, significantly, but uh, through his drone uh, uh, architectural works, he deserves to be known. And he deserves to be known exactly because he has both sides. Yes, there is an architecture which could have been in the 18th century, but it's also an architecture which could be, which could be now. Uh, I mean, you know, the quest for monumentality still exists. The human drama is still the same. Uh, the turmoil, the inner turmoil and the outer turmoil are, are, are the same. So psychologically speaking, at least, 
the truth of his etchings is, uh, is uh, of our time as well. Now, of course, when you look at these drawings and these etchings, you wouldn't ask functionalist questions. You know, you wouldn't ask, well, how am I going to bring the refrigerator in? Or is the, you know, the corridor wide enough to maybe bring the piano in? Or I mean, where is the parking uh, space? No, this is not about uh, functionalism. This is about something else. And that's why people still talk about him, because he, if he would have cons concerned himself with the uh, functionalist, uh, you know, uh, uh, banalities in his time, we would not have talked about him today. Okay, forget this. I will go now uh, uh, to, to the next uh, uh, presentation, which is uh, uh, on the Frenchman. The Frenchman I discovered come, come myself, uh, I knew nothing about Paul Abadi until uh, last night. And I'm happy I, I discovered him because uh, uh, he deserves it. He deserves to, to be known. So uh, he's described, Paul Abadi is, is, is described as a master builder uh, on Wikipedia, but he was trained as an architect. And uh, uh, well, a good architect should be, I think, also some kind of a master builder, or at least uh, this was the case case until uh, uh, Alberti. Uh, Brunelleschi was a master builder, and he, 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 at that time, the conception of the architect, uh, you know, sitting on an ergonomical chair at a drafting board or in front of the computer was unknown. Anyway. Paul Abadi. <clears throat> Paul Abadi apparently also contributed to the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, well, the reconstruction of the, uh, yes, because Notre Dame de Paris had many problems over the centuries and he took over uh, after Violet Le Duc and became the, the master of that uh, building site at Notre Dame, but, or Notre Dame, but I will not talk about that. Now I'll talk about other works by him, where he was also the architect, where he, he didn't reconstruct the building or you know, uh, did some refurbishments or whatever. I will only show now works built above all, I mean, from, from his uh, sketches uh, uh, and from his conception. This was the man, uh, Paul Abadi, uh, you know, elegant and uh, kind of assured of himself. Uh, he obviously was important if uh, at that time, uh, you know, he had uh, photographs made of him and uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, elaborated. You see his uh, uh, left arm is on a, on a book and, uh, you know, uh, he's a thinker and a doer. As, uh, as um, Gaston Bachelard said, you know, the, the man of thought should act like a man of knowledge and the man of knowledge should act like a doer. Uh, so the thinker and the doer should complement each other in the same person. But here he looks rather like a banker. Anyway, uh, and this so-called banker actually built many churches. In fact, you are going to see only churches with the exception of a, of a lycée, you know, a college or a high school. Now, Hotel de Ville, no, no, I'm wrong. I also built this, uh, This uh, I forgot about this. Uh, Hotel de Ville is a city hall. It's, uh, you know, uh, like uh, a secular uh, building, uh, but it looks like, uh, as you can see, it's uh, the man was, uh, was um, um, you know, uh, in love with the Gothic and it shows. And you don't quite know if you look at this building, you don't quite know when was it built. Uh, well, it was built in the 19th century, the same century when in, in Great Britain also there was a great revival of the Gothic. So we had the neo-Gothic uh, movement, which was quite strong in England, 
But look, even in France, uh, there were architects who, uh, you know, revitalized uh, uh, the Gothic. So it's, you know, it's a city hall, but it's also, you know, like a kind of like a castle, you know, a citadel almost, uh, you know, with towers. Of course, uh, we cannot accept easily this mimetic uh, references to a different century, you know. Uh, it's true, it, it, it seems to be too easy, but, uh, what can we do? This was the 19th century. And as I said, in the 19th century, both in England and, 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 uh, and France, and perhaps in other parts as well, the return of the Gothic was strong. Now a church, Saint Ferdinand de Bordeaux in Bordeaux, 1862, 1867, uh, yeah, he, I mean, he, I think he was a convincing uh, and convinced um, builder, maybe not a very great uh, innovator, but I understood in the, in the past years, his uh, oeuvre began to be reconsidered and uh, he's uh, seen highly now. Uh, and I, from what I see, I didn't visit his buildings. Uh, you know, uh, yes, it's, a, it's an architecture that you don't quite know for sure when it was built, but it's, you cannot uh, say that it is, uh, you know, uh, unbearably significant or uh, ugly, or I don't know how you want to describe it. Église Notre Dame de Chateau, uh, another church. This one is a little bit funny. Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> I mean, this one probably I would have said that it's, uh, but also maybe because it's so clean, I probably would have thought that it is, um, you know, 19th century or so, anyone newer, because it doesn't have, I don't know, the proportions seem to be wrong and, uh, and uh, you know, it's cleanness, you know, it doesn't have that patina of authenticity. It certainly doesn't show that it, it was built in the, the 12th century. No, it's much newer and it is, it's the 19th century. But from the back looks better or from this angle uh, or at night maybe a little bit, but uh, that rose window is too big for that uh, little facade, I think. Anyway, uh, but in this postcard, I kind of, I kind of like it because the, the postcard has a patina. And so, you know, time is present, uh, you know, uh, on the postcard, even if it is not so present in the building itself, in the, in the images uh, you saw. Uh, <laughs> there is a crash, you know, uh, on the left. Anyway, uh, yeah, from this angle is, is okay, I think, you know. Um, and even for from from this angle, but not so much from the front facade. I would say it's a smaller church you know, than uh, is. That's why it's a church. It's not a cathedral. Uh, the French have so many. You know, now is another one built by the same master builder, Église Saint Marie de la Bastille, de Bordeaux, à Bordeaux again, um, with an impressive tower. And this impressive tower, you'll also see in the case of another architect that I'm, go I'm going to present today. Um, I don't know, I mean, you know, they, he built a lot of churches and um, obviously, uh, plus this, what I'm going to show you today, what I am showing you today is really a very small number. I only show the buildings where he had the conception. So he erected these buildings from the very beginning but he has a large uh, list of, of works where he was working on existing buildings, doing the various changes and so on, like he worked for Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, I will end this presentation with a famous work in Paris that all tourists uh, rush to, uh, <laughs> and that's why it's unbearably uh, busy around the, that uh, that basilica and uh, also um, 
inside. Uh, anyway, so Eglise Notre Dame de Bergerac, uh, you know, kind of similar to the previous one. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it is very rewarding to, 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 to build churches, you know. Unfortunately, not every part of the world can benefit from uh, the chance to be creative when you build churches. And I'm talking about my, about my own country where the church is very dogmatic and doesn't allow for creativity at all. Anyway, um, on the other hand, you could say, well, you know, uh, here there isn't so much creativity either because it's the, you know, the medieval, uh, the Middle Ages uh, dogma that is uh, implemented. Yeah, in this case, to an extent, perhaps yes. But still some uh, impressive things are done, like here, you know, it's, uh, I, if I didn't know it was built in the 19th century, I would have said this was built in the 12th century and I would have been wrong. Um, well, this facade maybe would have made me say that it, it is a newer work, not just because it's very clean, but also the, the ornamentation is, is kind of um, facile oh, and uh, too decorative. Eglise Neo Roman Saint Georges in Musidon. Uh, this one also, you know, it, it has the patina of time. It, it, it is, uh, you know, it looks uh, convincingly old, but it's not so old. It's, it's the 19th century. So, sorry, this one is another building, and I meant to to erase it, and I forgot. It's also by him, but it's not the building house door you already saw. This is uh, rather a temple. Uh, and uh, an image of the of the church I began with um, two images earlier, and uh, yeah, now uh, a high school uh, lycée uh, liceo in Romanian in Angoulême. Uh, commencé par son père. His father began this building and he continued it. Uh, it's this building. I don't have uh, great pictures with it. It's, it's this building here. You know, a rational uh, <laughs> torture chamber for uh, the students. I am malicious. I shouldn't say so. But uh, when I think of that, uh, ah, I forgot. I wanted to play a uh, Maybe, maybe uh, we'll make an intermezzo to listen to a song which I love, which was launched today uh, by a, um, a, a great uh, singer, I think. Uh, um, uh, it's a Beatles song which was launched today, a very famous song, and I, I, I intended to play it for you, but I forgot in the rush to put everything together because it was a little more difficult today because there are four people that I have to talk about. So this is the Le Lycée built by uh, the same architect and uh, well, you will say nothing exceptional here, I guess, I, I, I don't know. It's... Now, this is the last one that I show and this is very famous in Paris, the Basilique du Sacré-Cœur de Montmartre. Uh, and the initial plan was inspired by the Cathedral uh, saint Front de Périgueux and you will see that uh, at, at the very end, a few images with that, um, um, you know, cathedral that apparently inspired Sacré-Cœur de Montmartre. So this is uh, the building where all tourists flock. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to arrive there because it's on top of a hill and you have to climb a lot of stairs. And uh, when you arrive there, uh, it's, it, it, I don't know, I was totally exhausted. I had no desire to enter the church. And, uh, but uh, it was uh, conceived by this architect, by Paul, but, but uh, he died before the building was completed. He, the, the building was completed like 15 years after he died, but it was uh, built on his plans. So it's a, f a famous uh, addition to the Parisian uh, landscape. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a famous basilica, but uh, it is a strange building because, you know, 
I don't know. It doesn't quite look. I I don't know. It has a strange uh, style. If I am to use the word style, it's it's something almost a little bit oriental about it. You know, it's it's not. It's not the typical cathedral or basilica, it's, and you will see the model it was based on. Um, anyway, but it is there to stay, and it has a glorious position. And uh, you know what else can you say? Uh, can you say uh, it's it, it will never, unless the end of the world will come, uh, that building will be here or there forever. Now. It was based on La Cathedrale Saint Front de Perigueux, and you will see what apparently inspired him to build a building in Paris. Uh, it's different, but uh, you know, you know the the top part of of those uh, you know uh, cylinders uh, has something similar. Uh, it, it has the same feeling. I don't know though, I should have checked, it's probably easy to find out on the web when this was built. You know, earlier, of course, since it influenced the Sacre Coeur, but I don't know when. Uh, even this one is a little bit uh, strange, but uh, it has something almost, I'm thinking a little bit of Borobudur, you know, uh, here on the top in Indonesia. Anyway, um, so, this is the building that inspired uh, uh, the man who, whose birthday is today and who also did many restorations for uh, important churches and other kinds of buildings. But I will stop here with him. And now I will go to, um, to the third architect I'm going to talk about today is the, <laughs> is the I shouldn't laugh, is the, the, the I almost said Frenchman, who got shot is actually a North American who got shot because he was romantically involved with, uh, with a lady. Uh, well, apparently he also raped her when she was very young and then the woman got married with another man and that other man shot Stanford White to death. But he was an immensely successful architect part of the big firm McKid, Mad and White, White being himself. And they built many, many buildings in New York City and the United States. And um, he was very influential. I became very rich, uh, very powerful. But he had this hobby to seduce very young girls, in fact, uh, uh, under the age, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, and uh, he succeeded. and. Uh, you know, the, the, the husband of, uh, of one of them later on shot him to death uh, in a theater or on the terrace of a theater. This was the man, I mean, you know, with that mustache, if I was a woman or a girl, I probably would have fallen for him too. You know, it's uh, that mustache is more impressive than Friedrich Nietzsche's. And yes, he has those seductive, seductive eyes of a guilty architect. Architects are irresistible, you know, uh, often uh, <laughs> because, you know, architects, as opposed to painters and writers and musicians, they kind of do okay, you know. They, I, I never heard of an architect dying of hunger, but I did hear of poets dying of hunger or other writers or musicians or painters, not architects. And architects can navigate through life approximately well, and uh, uh, it is what it is. But I don't think there is another architect in the world, in the history of the world, who, who was killed, was murdered by a jealous husband. Frank Lloyd White was also uh, had problems with jealous husbands because he was also uh, practicing the art of seduction with the wives of uh, his clients but he never got shot. Although he had other problems. Uh, once uh, someone in his service uh, put his uh, tailies and list uh, to, to fire and the woman he loved, uh, who was not actually his wife, uh, died. She was decapitated in fact, and her, her sons too, a, a very tragic story. But why didn't die? Stanford White died. 
Uh, here he is with uh, two or with, uh, I know the one on the left was his partner. I don't know the one in the middle who is, but he's here on the right, uh, quite elegant, of course. Uh, and uh, now we see President Theodore Roosevelt sitting in a chair designed by White for the state dining room of the White House, 1903. So, you know, if an architect has the chance to design the chair on which the president of the country sits, it's not such, I would say, it's not the smallest thing in the world. So here he is, the proud president sitting, uh, you know, but perhaps a little bit uh, stiff, a little bit uncomfortably on the, on the, the elaborate uh, chair that uh, Stanford White uh, designed for him. It's kind of a bourgeois throne, if I can use such a strange uh, uh, way of for formulating it. Okay, so the president of the United States sitting on a chair designed by this architect was murdered by a jealous uh, husband. So Stanford White, the famed architect of the prolific firm McKim, Med and White, designed an exorbitant amount of buildings in New York City throughout the Gilded Age, from places of entertainment and the homes of New York's elite to utilitarian structures and the college campus, White's designs varied in scale and purpose, but always had a sense of grandeur and great attention to detail. Here are 20 past and present buildings in New York City that were designed by Stamford White. I, I was, I meant to, but in a rush to add up all these things together, I, I didn't include a picture of the woman uh, Stanford White died for, so to speak. Anyway, we go through 20 buildings by him. He built much more, but I said 20 is enough for the moment. Maybe next year I will show more. Henry Cook Mansion. So the Henry Cook Mansion is often thought to be a part of the Payne Whitney House since they are adjacent structures that have very similar, uh, they have very similar style, but they are in fact two separate residences. So this Henry Cook, a banker and railroad tycoon, commissioned White to build him a townhouse on the illustrious Fifth Avenue. So White designed it an, an Italian Renaissance palazzo style home with more than 15,000 square feet of living space, but neither her, well, what do you mean neither her? Neither him nor Cook would live to see it com complete. A year after Cook died, leaving the unfinished home to his daughters, White was murdered, murdered, somebody didn't write uh, in correct English here, on the roof of his Madison Square Garden, which he also built, and you are going to see it. The townhouse tan was complete in 1907. So is the one on the right, very similar to the next one on the right, which was also designed by him. Uh, but we'll arrive there. Now we see a, a strange monument, or maybe not so strange. It's, um, I'm not going to read, I, I, I had good intentions. I included this, this text, which I didn't write. I, I, I took them from a, from a website, but uh, I, I don't like to read during my presentations because it's not spontaneous enough and I get bored and you probably get bored too. So I'll just uh, at random read a few lines. So this is a single Tory column known now as the prison she marked this monument is topped with an eight ton bronze funeral urn by sculptor Adolf Heinemann. This is what it is. You know, it's just, maybe he was, I don't know, no, no, no. At that time Adolf Loss didn't propose that uh, Chicago Tribune Tower in the shape of a Tory column. As, uh, as it is here. Anyway, so Payne Whitney House, that is next door to the one that you already saw. So now home to the cultural services of the French embassy, was designed by him again for a financier and philanthropist who was well known. Strange these philanthropists. First, they make a lot of money by stealing because I know what is uh, real estate, uh, you know, transactions are or the Wall Street uh, manipulations of money. It's essentially stealing. And then they become philanthropists because, you know, the time of the judgment, uh, you know, approaches. So you have to clear up 
part of the guilt and then you become a philanthropist, but really a financier and a philanthropist, I think are the two sides of the same coin. Uh, so uh, <laughs> apparently, um, um, anyway, I hear I'm a little bit confused because Whitney is not white, but anyway, I thought it was the wife of the architect after, after he was uh, murdered. Anyway, this is one of the last reminders of the age of elegance and an integral part of the last complete block of impressive townhouses remaining on the avenue. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, what's so great about it really? It's, I don't know. Capitalism is, I think it's terrible when it, it advertises. In fact, if I like anything about this house, is the ivy, that's it. <laughs> The ivy, the green, the the, mod the most humble and modest of plants, that I like the most about this building. Like Bernard Chumi said about Villa Savoie, he said, you know, the only architectural thing about Villa Savoie is the state of decay it was in when he was uh, very young and visited it. Now it's not any longer decayed. The Harry Cook Mansion, uh, ah, this one you saw. Uh, why am I showing again? Now, Century Association Clubhouse. The capitalists had all the clubs in the world. They, they organized themselves into clubs and they had, of course, clubhouses where they would meet and have a great time. You know, what can you do? Celebrating their power and their uh, grandiosity. So he designed the permanent clubhouse of the Century Association in 1889, three years after he was elected as a member to the club and 42 years after the club was established. The Italian Renaissance structure is made of granite, terracotta and brick. The club has a striking front facade with a monumental arched entrance doorway underneath a Palladian window centered between four handsomely red rest uh, round windows, uh, you know, uh, you see the Palladian window. I don't know, this kind of architecture is pathetic, you know, I mean, borrowing things from here and there and pasting them on, on, on uh, you know, buildings. Anyway, Madison Square Presbyterian Church, here it is, uh, temple-like, uh, yeah, in fact, its facade is not so very different from uh, New York Stock Exchange. You know, one dealing with money, the other one dealing, and I underline the word, uh, the word dealing with God, because in capitalism, it's all about transactions. You make transactions with money and you make transactions with God. It's all about commerce, uh, really. And uh, the former President Trump uh, published a book, The Art of the Deal. You know, the, the word deal is horrid, it's horrible, you know. I mean, you know, it, it's a world without dignity, you know, and without ethics. You know, I, I struck a deal, I made a deal, you know. I mean, you know, this is the language of merchants. This is not the, the language of creators and uh, idealists and uh, dreamers and regular people. No, it's, it's, it's the world of uh, merchants. I'm not going to read this. I don't know why I placed this, this text here. Again, the Palladian structure was demolished only 13 years later to make way for insurance. Of course, insurance offices. Even now, when I turn on the radio, I hear all the, all the, all the invitations in the world. Are you over 50? Are you insured? You are not insured? How could you live like this? It is the culture of fear. You know, uh, according to the New York Times, a doorway from Madison Square turned up in a storage of the Brooklyn Museum. The church Tiffany windows with biblical scenes now illuminate the wedding chapel at the hotel in Riverside, California. Can you believe it? This is uh, this is the world we are in. You know, it's it's a world built up of uh, transactions and collectors and so on. Harmony Club. 4 East 60th Street, so everything you saw until now is New York City. You know, what can you say? It's a club, it's a hotel, it's what is it here? Chandeliers, uh, you know, rugs on which it is written 1852, uh, you know, showing the despair of not having a very significant 
longevity in terms of history. Uh, Admitters, a uh, group of six German New Yorkers created their own social club. Uh, now the Harmony Club is society is the second oldest social club in your city and is made up of men and women who are prominent leaders in the world of business and finance, law, science, med medicine, arts, and all works of life. Come on, let's let's be let's be honest here. What all works of life? Uh, uh, Stanford Y designed their second clubhouse, which the club moved into in 1905. The bazaar structure designed by White once had a basement, bowling alley, and bedrooms on the upper floors that are no longer there. The club retains the original dining room designed by Stanford White, as well as other impressive club facilities. I was, uh, you know, the, unfortunately, the explanations are after the picture. So it's about this. Okay, Tiffany and Company building. Everything is and Company. I'm sure they also had the expression God and Company uh, or Jesus and Company. Uh, yeah, they are big buildings uh, built approximately well. I mean, you know, after 100 years, the building is just like when it was built, actually, they, they, they do age well in the sense that they don't quite age. But, but in essence, it's still a capitalist building. It's, it's, uh, you can tell that the raison d'etre is not very pure, actually. I know I lived in your city for many years. I, I, I know what I'm saying. This is, this is a hardcore capitalism that, uh, you know, uh, whose religion is, is money or the dollar. In 1903, then president of Tiffany and Company, Charles Cook reportedly asked the firm of McKean, Madden White to build him a palace. Of course, they all need palaces. The interpretation of that request was this building, a seven story white marble structure based on the 16th century Palazzo Grimani in Venice. The the building appears to only have three stories, thanks to the three horizontal divisions that frame rows of two-story windows Corinthian columns. You see here, it's true. <laughs> you say that it has only three floors. The art of deceivement, or yeah. Tiffany and company moved move there and establishes the most prestigious and sophisticated shopping Shopping, of course, I shop, therefore I am thoroughfares. For a one fifth was given landmark designation in the 80s, and Tiffany's moved its headquarters further up Fifth Avenue. The Villar houses on Madison Avenue. Ah, uh, here it was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Architectural League of, of New York. Uh, I have been in this building. Uh, it, what can we say? It's, you know, uh, a building built uh, with opulence and with, uh, you know, remnants of culture and, and nostalgias for old Europe, uh, but still distinctly uh, North American. Why design these six neo-Italian neo -Italian Renaissance townhouses for a journalist, financier, an early president of Northern Pacific Railway? Ah, uh, these North Americans, they, turn everything into a business, everything. The brownstone structures are arranged into one U-shaped unit surrounding a courtyard, originally planned as a turnaround for carriages. This landmark house of mansions has a stately and dignified appearance based on 16th century palaces. Of course, of course, this was exactly what Frank Lloyd Wright was against. You know, this, this mimicking of uh, European architecture, but in the new world. Anyway, Rob House, 23 Park Avenue. Uh, what can we say? Another building. Uh, built, uh, well, this current co op building was once the private residence of James Hampton Rob, a former New York senator and commissioner of the Parks Department. One of the earliest Renaissance revival style townhouses, why designs designed. The most dignified structure in all that quarter of the town, not a palace, but the fit dwelling house for a first rate citizen. Now, what is a fair first rate citizen? 
apparently uh, Stanford White was too at the moment when he was shot to death by a jealous husband. Anyway, another building, 900 Broadway. Uh, what can we say? Strangely, this is called a mansion. It was made built for one man, but it actually looks like a, you know, I mean, it is named a mansion, a mansion for one family, for one person, but it's a block of flats from what I see. Why design ma mansions for most wealthy, proeminent New Yorkers of the Gilded Age, including the Gurlet family? The Gurlets were originally hardware merchants. They were all merchants, also incredible, you know? I mean, the, the, this, this pragmatism turned uh, uh, into commerce, uh, I don't know, sickens me. And in the late 1800 brothers, Robert and Ogden started building real estate. Well, what, what was that? It's buying and selling with a higher price. That, that's what it was. The structure is seemingly sleek compared to some of White's other more ornate designs constructed in the Chicago school, school style. The facade is a mix of different shades of brick and cream color terracotta arranged in sotus, basket weave, and linear patterns. It rises 10 stories high. After the death of these brothers, they hire sold the buildings to a developer. And anyway, it's a whole story here, which has to do again with money and real estate and transactions. We move forward. The cable building, 611. Uh, yeah, another building in Manhattan. We move forward. I'm not going to read this. Uh, Judson Memorial Church. Now, finally, we, 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 we turn to God. And uh, it's a little difficult to see, uh, with the exception of the, of the, um, you know, the bell tower, uh, uh, because there are there is the competition behind with the building uh, actually taller than the, the bell tower of the church. Uh, yeah, with financial help, Baptist preacher was able to hire Stanford White. You know what that means. If the preacher was a became able to hire, means you know Stanford White asked for a certain amount of money to 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 perform his services. That is when he was not busy uh, seducing uh, underage girls. The exterior with terracotta ornamentation, yellow Roman brick and marble panels and the campanile is reminiscent of early Renaissance churches. They all loved Renaissance with the exception of Frank Lloyd Wright who hated Renaissance. That's why he said no Renaissance, but Naissance, meaning birth, not rebirth because Renaissance means rebirth. And uh, this was against the, creative uh, fundamentalism of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Anyway, uh, savings bank, because I told you there are two things of importance. You know, one is the bank and the other one is, uh, is the church. And actually they look a little bit similar in the case of the architecture uh, in some places and by some people in, in, uh, in uh, New York and the New World, not in all the cases, but in some cases. You remember there was a church that I showed some images to before that was uh, in spirit not very different from the bank, this bank. I'm not going to read, sorry. Um, Con Edison, but this is an interesting building because it has, uh, Con Edison is still the electricity company in the United States, or at least on the East Coast, or at least in New York. Uh, is a very powerful uh, company and they he, he built this uh, uh, power plant and I, I am actually very surprised to see this uh, conjunction between uh, uh, you know that uh, tall part which is uh, you know so contemporary and modern and then the base which is historicist and I don't think they go together at all but uh, well that's what Stanford uh, White uh, Thought appropriate. Uh, the art is uh, stunning when it. Uh, I'm not going to read, I'm sorry. Uh, Bronx Community College. I only have this image. Uh, what can we say? It's uh, historicism, it's copy and paste with some. Uh, abilities. He was a virtuoso, he was very good at this. 
And, uh, but, but essentially he was not really, I wouldn't call him a creator with the exception, I would say of the Penn Station. The Penn Station, and it's too bad, I, I don't have here the appropriate uh, picture. I, I wanted to, to, to develop that presentation about Penn, uh, Penn Station, but I incorporated an image in the, in the invitational text I sent out today. Uh, and I apologize, I don't have more uh, appropriate um, uh, pictures. A very important building, that one, and it was destroyed again, demolished for uh, commercial reasons. The Herald building, uh, again, welcome to uh, mimicking uh, Italian influence and inspiration, but it's something so inauthentic about it that uh, I, I feel like moving forward, sorry. Uh, why basically design again on Venetian Renaissance Palazzo, you know, come on. Some criticized it for being too perfect a copy. <laughs> yeah, I would understand, but I wouldn't call it perfect. It's, uh, it's not perfect, but a copy it is. Anyway, moving forward, Pennsylvania Station. This was great and uh, really I have a suggestion for you and I add my apologies that I don't have better pictures of it. If you have a few minutes, search on the web at, for Penn Station. You can just uh, type in with few uh, letters, P-E-N-N, -N, Penn Station, Stanford White, or Old Penn Station, and you'll see it was huge. I mean, really, really huge. It was demolished, but it had very interesting interiors. From the outside, it, it just looks huge. But it was uh, um, inside uh, very spectacular, uh, probably in this area here. Anyway, uh, moving forward, the original McKee Madden White Design Station built for the opening phase, you know, was officially completed in 1910. It was massive indeed, an architectural wonder that spent two city blocks. Uh, Manhattan terminus for Long Island Railroad. Uh, trains at that time were probably sophisticated in the United States, but I can tell you now that the trains in the United States are a shame. They are slow. Their design is, uh, is very awkward and heavy. And uh, really, you cannot compare them with the trains in, uh, in Europe or J Japan or China. No, it's impossible. Because, because it is an industry that collapsed because uh, only the very poor use the train. And, uh, you know, the, the, the automobile industry, um, uh, you know, sabotaged the, the, you know, the railways because they didn't want competition. So, and plus this is a culture without too much interest in uh, investing in the, in the collective realm or the public realm. It's all about individualism. And the train is not about individualism, it's about collectiveness. Anyway, the Metropolitan Club, what can we say? Uh, Metropolitan Cube with some flags hanging there, probably elegant, probably opulent, but it leaves me cold. You know, it's, it is what, what you see actually, grayish and, uh, you know, I almost uh, express myself in a paradoxical way. Uh, uh, you know, there is a hypocrisy here, I would say. You know, it's, it's grandiose in its uh, apparent uh, uh, reticence. Uh, Stanford, why describe this club building for the New York Times as unrivaled in its size? Oh, what is this architecture? It's about quality, not quantity an appearance unlike that of any building in New York. Now, really, what is distinguished uh, by a group of distinguished gentlemen, proeminent, everybody was distinguished here, meaning they, they had a lot of money. That's what it uh, meant. You see the word financial is continuously present. And uh, so uh, really, what, what, what's so great about this building? Make me understand because I don't. I'm not trying to diminish. He was a skilled architect, but uh, not a great creator. Now, the Madison Square Garden, which is a very famous destination now, but this is the old building. And again, you would say that you are in Toledo or I don't know, somewhere in Spain. No, you are in, in Manhattan, in, uh, in, uh, in 
New York City and you can see that you are uh, here. You know, but this is an old picture and, uh, you know, if you are prone to nostalgias, why not? Uh, in fact, you might even wonder what kind of function it has. You know, like here you would say this must be a church or something. Well, it's not. <laughs> Anyway, he designed the second of four Madison Square Gardens that have existed in various locations around New York City. The first arena to bear the name was Great Roman Hippodrome near Madison Square Park. The building became Madison Square Garden when it was purchased by the gentleman Vanderbilt in 1879. That building was demolished in 1989 and replaced next year by White's Moorish style theater with funding from big name uh, New Yorkers like Andy Carnegie, Carnegie, the Astor, J.P. Morgan, White went all out. He certainly did for the Moorish style theater. You know, I mentioned Spain, I was not too far away. Anyway, um, the Washington Square Arch, which I know quite well, it was copied or inspired by, uh, you know, the triumphal arch of, of Paris. Uh, you know, and he designed it for free, incredible. Before the construction, of, uh, you know, with an exclamation mark, because this is very unusual for an American architect, but he had enough money to give him it. Uh, so he drew inspiration from sites in Rome and, and in Paris, Arc de Triomphe. Um, so wanted his arch to look more modern and simple than the one in Paris. He did incorporate antique elements such as allegorical figures, bands of decorative motifs, and reds of laurel. The relief work on the arch was done by the sculptor, and the eagle's perch on top were created by Philippe Martini. Two sculptures are uh, created by, um, anyway, uh, yeah, the players. Because you know the rich people, they make the money, then they make a club, and then they play cards or some other things. And uh, here it is, you know, they met there and they sat comfortably and they smoked cigars, and they, uh, you know, uh, enjoyed life after a hard day of uh, moving money from one pocket to another. Anyway. No, I'm not going to read about this. And I think I will end this uh, capriciously, uh, you know, I don't know how to say, I feel like saying crystallized, but it was crystallized at all. This capriciously made uh, uh, presentation. This is, a, this is the website from where I um, compile this, uh, this presentation. And now I go to the last one, if you are still here. Uh, but even if you are not here, I will, I will finish my job with, um, with uh, Sir Gilles Gilbert Scott, the British man uh, who uh, is interesting, I think. Uh, so he was also a sir. Everybody in his family was made a sir you know, for high uh, achievements. So he lived from 1880 to 1960. So he's the youngest in our group of four that we celebrate today. Was an English architect known for his work on the Cambridge University Library, Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, Battersea Power Station, Liverpool Cathedral, and designing the Icon Red telephone box, which is very nice, I, I, I confess. Scott came from a family of architects. He was noted for his blending of Gothic tradition with modernism, making what might otherwise have been functionally designed buildings into, into popular landmarks. Here is the man. We, obviously, we are moving uh, into the second half of the 20th century. And the Liverpool Cathedral in 2012, but it was built uh, 100 years later or uh, um, earlier or so, uh, and um, I think it's a good building. I mean, you know, you don't judge it in terms of its modernity, but in terms of its being convincing as a volume, as a mass, as a robust uh, building, uh, you know, worthy to be named uh, the house of God. 
So it's the Liverpool Cathedral that we are seeing here that was built by Sir Gilles Gilbert Scott. Now we see the cropped horn port from 1930. Uh, you know, what can we say? You know, there is a certain modesty in uh, in uh, in grandeur here. You know, it's. I think it's okay. You know, there are apartment buildings, but uh, you know, not very original, but not very without any character either. I would say. Anyway, the red telephone box is preserved as a tourist attraction near Covent Garden in London. And here they are. They, you know, you are probably familiar with them. They were designed by this uh, sir, by this architect, not the sculpture, but the telephone boots. And uh, I think they're interesting. I, I, I think he did a good job. Uh, and I, he probably laughed at, uh, at what he was doing. I mean, you know, telephones in general. I'm not sure he would have loved the mobile phones. I, I really have a big trouble with problem with the, with the mobile phone. Because the mobile phone is so petit in French, is so, I don't know, pathetically convenient. And, you know, why are we to be continuously available, to continuously carry on us a telephone? Why? I mean, you know, like in the Ecclesiastics was said, there is a time to love and there is a time to hate. There is a, a time to communicate and there is a time not to communicate. I don't think we are supposed to be continuously available you know, on the street, in uh, wherever, you know, in bed, you know, continuously to be with a telephone there under the pillow. But this building, the Buttersea Power Station, maybe you know because of a, of a cover of, a, of an album by Pink Floyd. I think it's a good building. I like it. Um, it's monumental. It celebrates industry, but it has a mysterious monumentality. It, 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 I don't know. I, I, I like it. Um, maybe from all the buildings I show today, with the exception of the, the inner prisons by uh, Piranesi, this one I like the most. Uh, and it was built by Sir Gilles Gilbert Scott. Now the Cambridge University Library, which opened in 1934, unfortunately I only have this picture, but maybe next year I will amplify uh, this, this presentation, uh, but not too much because it, it is really exhausting to talk about four important architects in, uh, in one presentation. Anyway, this is a library by him. Now a memorial to Scott inside the cathedral, which cathedral? The Lincoln Cathedral, set into the floor beneath the central tower. You see Sir Gilles Gilbert Scott, 1880-1960. So he was born exactly 140 years ago on this very day. Scott's grave at Liverpool Cathedral. Uh, I don't know about this grave. I mean, graves are, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, sad, sad uh, presences, but uh, this one, I don't know, it, it doesn't have a lot of grace. I only hope he, it wasn't him who designed it. Anyway, this is a house which is kind of interesting, I think. You know, it's, it has a modern cut. It is uh, almost, almost minimalist, but the windows make it uh, something else, you know, uh, some kind of a pastoral minimalism or bucolic minimalism or nostalgic minimalism. I don't know how to describe it. But otherwise, if you would replace the windows with, let's say, just a blank piece of glass, you'll have a resolutely modern building. But those, those windows uh, say something else, which is kind of interesting, you know. Anyway. North block of Guildhall. This, it's almost uh, brutalist from Poland or from South Southeastern uh, European country. It looks like a hospital with the exception of the majestic entrance and the sculptural elements at the entrance. Otherwise the building itself is, uh, we have seen things like this 
uh, built in various parts of the world. Now, Whiteland Teacher Training College, uh, while undergoing conversion to residential accommodation. So this was a college. Uh, well, <laughs> nothing very glorious, really. I mean, you know, I don't know. Maybe if we would have flattened the, the fence, we would have seen some, some splendid things. But above the fence, I don't know. We, we don't see really uh, exceptionally astonishing uh, buildings. Clare College, Cambridge Memorial Court. He liked these windows, obviously, you know, and they are domestic, they are sweet, they are uh, affectionate, uh, they, they, they uh, yeah, they express domesticity. Maybe too much. We are approaching the end of, of this uh, uh, presentation uh, about for architects. Chester House. Uh, again, you know, he's becoming a little bit tiring with the way he, why didn't he change the, the, you know, the patterns on the windows of something, you know, he just repeats this uh, grid, this uh, fragmentation into little squares, which I like too, but I only like once, not twice, not three times, not four times, it's too much, Mr. Scott, please, please, you are, sir, you are supposed to surprise us, tower at the Cambridge University Library, no, a tower is a tower. What can we say? Even if it's not skillfully done, a tower is a tower. William Booth Memorial Training College. Again, the tower, the power of the cross and the power of verticality, the power of manhood, the power of faith. Too much power, actually. I think true faith should be a little more modest, but Guinness Brewery Park Royal during demolition. It looked good during demolition. No, I mean, I, I don't, obviously the demolition didn't yet start because the buildings are splendid in this light and uh, they seem to reject the idea that one day they will be uh, flattened. Uh, but I see something there showing some disarray in between the buildings on the right side, but right now to call this picture during demolition it's a little bit too much anyway again this was my way of saying i didn't do the writing saint joseph church built between 1910 and 1936 i like our churches you know and, and if they are in brick even better perhaps uh, it's a nave there that probably is, is spacious enough and uh, I don't know if luminous enough, probably there are big windows on the sides. Uh, the British uh, could, could be convincing in their work with brick. The Bankside power station, now the Tate Modern, where also, uh, you know, Herzog and de Moron did the work recently or approximately recently. It's, uh, it's a famous, uh, uh, destination for cultural tourism, or it was until the pandemic. Um, he liked he liked the uh, towers, obviously, but in this case it was a power station. So I guess you know, just like in the case of uh, uh, Stanford White for Con Edison, you know, uh, you have a power station, you are supposed to to have power for functional uh, you know reasons, if not symbolic reasons. Okay, so here we have Tate Gallery these days, very important, uh, you know, cultural venue. Now uh, we come back to the telephone box in the Liverpool Anglican Church Cathedral. I don't know who wrote this text, but is it true that the telephone box is in the cathedral? To me, it sounds strange, you know, I hope it's not. I hope it's outside of the cathedral and not inside the cathedral, for God's sake. You know, <laughs> I, I, I can't truly really tell from here if it is inside and or if it is outside. It might be that it is inside. Can you believe it to place a, a telephone booth inside the cathedral? But this is the world we live in. What can we say? You know, that's why in England I read twice a year, no, two churches a year, and I read it some years ago were desacralized, transformed into something else, even one of them into a circus. 
you know, uh, for to exercise because it has a tall ceiling. Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in Kensington. I think it was good. I mean, even this building is 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 telling us clearly. I am a church, and it is a church now. Would I place a telephone booth inside? I don't think I would. But what can we say? Um, that's it. Thank you very much. I don't believe it. There are still four people here. I, I just I, I, I don't think I deserve. <laughs>